But uh, next speaker, um, I'm a huge fan of this guy. Very clever, working uh, very consistently, good quality. Also a very fun, nice person. Part of the coffee collective here in Denmark. If you haven't been to one of their stores, uh, you should leave immediately and go now. Just wait half an hour, yeah. I, I don't think I need to say anymore, but uh, please welcome Klaus Thompson. Thank you. And uh, I'm a father of two, so I know that bribes work. <laughs> so I put a little uh, caramel for you on your seat, and then um, you actually uh, you are beta testers of this. Uh, this is a new product that uh, we're launching together with another company on Jesperger, the street where we open our first coffee shop. It's a coffee caramel, and it's with this coffee from Kini. So I thought it was very uh, relevant to bring the first batch of this caramel uh, for you today. So I hope you like it. Thank and if nothing else, it'll uh, keep you busy chewing, so you'll shut up while I talk. <laughs> I thought I would do. Well, today I'm going to give a uh, talk on our relationship with uh, Kini in uh, Kenya. And it's not a, it's not a talk about me bragging about uh, how we do direct trade and how awesome it is and everything. It's more a, a talk inspired by conversations I had with Tim um, about how we source. And uh, Tim said he thought there was a story somewhere in there that might be worth sharing with you guys today. But a little bit of uh, background. <clears throat> I first traveled to Kenya in 2007. <clears throat> and this is what it looked like. And I don't think I had a freaking clue what I was doing holding a branch of coffee in a very weird pose. But uh, it was a very exciting trip. I was there uh, on an Oregon trip visiting farmers and um, judging the Kenyan Barista Championship, actually. And um, a few years after, no, actually, the, the, uh, later that year, actually, this was in two, the, uh, 2007, we founded our company, the Coffee Collective here in uh, Copenhagen. And in uh, the 2008-09 harvest, so the one that, that actually ships out in 2009, we bought uh, the first direct trade coffee uh, from Kenya, um, from Kiawa Um And in 2009-10 harvest, we bought for the first time from, um, from this place called Kieni. Um, and we got it home and we absolutely loved it. Uh, our customers loved the coffee. And in January 2011, I got to go back uh, to visit them. And that was then the second year we bought from Kini, and we've been buying from them every year since then, and visiting them. This was also the first time we got to cup together with uh, the members of Kini, and here next to Casper is uh, Charles Ihatu Mwai, who was the chairman of Kini until uh, last year. And through these uh, travels to them, these visits, I can tell you we've learned heaps about coffee, about coffee in Kenya, about the everyday of the farmers. And it's given us a lot of stories that we've been able to share with our customers back in Copenhagen. And in spite of that, I still feel every time I go that I'm still scratching the surface. There's so much to understand, so much to learn. So I don't feel like I'm in any way an expert on Kenya or know a lot. Every time I go, I try to meet with people who know other stuff, people from the university or the research department or exporters or so on. In the first years, I just struggled to try and understand all the stuff that was going on, the, the processing methods, uh, the special kind of, I, I think a lot of you know, the, the, the Kenyan way of processing with the intermediate washing. I was writing these long, long, absurdly long blog posts with fermentation times and what I thought the intermediate washing was doing and so on. And I still try to, to see if I can get my head around it, but I'm nowhere near understanding it. And I go and see these, uh, these trees in Nyeri, um, coffee trees planted in the 1960s, so they're over 50 years old, with these incredibly huge root structures, like a thick, thick, thick root, like a tree, sucking up nutrients to a tree that's continuously uh, cropped. So it's just small branches that it has to deliver nutrients from. But I also learned on these trips that there's almost no, or basically no organic coffee to be found anywhere in Kenya. I also learned that the uh, extension services, the agronomists who are there to educate and help farmers, was focusing quite a lot on yield and not so much on quality and sustainability. 
Um, as an example, I remember going to, uh, to visit a, uh, a factory with an agronomist, and he was explaining to me about the soaking tanks. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with that, but after the washing, you tend to soak the coffee in clean water. And he was explaining to me that, yeah, we can soak the coffee here for anywhere between 4 to 48 hours. I was like, oh, it doesn't affect quality? No, no, no. I was like, oh, okay, so, so you did, it doesn't, like, I was very curious, so you did, like, uh, experimentations with like, taking out samples every four hours and like, you know <laughs> and this is like an example of all these things where we, we still don't really know a lot of the stuff that we're doing it's just being done what's interesting for me last year uh, at the university in Erie I met a, a grad student who was uh, who's actually writing her I think her masters on exactly that how does the soaking times affect quality and so on but there's still so much to learn and I feel sometimes like me who touched upon this a little bit Sometimes the agronomists are also maybe where, I don't know, Danish agronomists were in the 80s. You have a problem and you have this solution to fix it, but there's not the, the wealth of solutions that are available to us in the richer Western world. Anyway, I want to dive right into what Keeney actually is and try to explain to you a little bit about the structure there, how things work. And I'll repeat a little bit about what uh, me was saying, but. I'll try to do it in a different way. So Keen is not a farm. It's a cooperative wet mill or factory, as they call it in Kenya. And for me personally, the, the cooperatives can be a real struggle to work with because of some of the things that Mia mentioned with the, 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 there's politics in it, there's a lot of uh, different opinions and so on. Um, but they are also kind of rewarding for me because about 70% of the coffee in Kenya is produced by smallholders who are typically members of cooperatives. It's 600,000 farmers who are smallholders. So if we want to have a big impact on some of the poorest people in the country, I think the cooperatives can be interesting to work with in that way. Now, Kiini, as an example, consists of around 1,000 members. When I say a member, it's, from my understanding, it's actually typically more a family. So they will have one member number, and the husband or wife will share that number to deliver to Kiini. Uh, they might also be a member of another factory, so they might deliver half the harvest to Kini and half the harvest to another washing station in the area. It's kind of, from what I gather, it's kind of you know betting on more horses because then you you hope that one of them will pay out uh, better. So each of the members grow and pick cherries and deliver to the mill. And at the factory, the mill manager, this guy is right now uh, just Pat Kadiyuki. And uh, he decides which stays the farmers uh, should pick and deliver cherries to the mill, so which stays they're going to run. And he also is responsible for how long the fermentation times and drying times and so on should be. He's also hugely responsible for uh, cherry selection and the quality that comes into the mill. So him and his uh, staff at the mill will tell farmers if they have to do better, if they have to like this guy have to pour out all the coffee and, and sort through it to get uh, unripes out. Uh, I've also seen him sending a full truck of coffee with different farmers who had been uh, picking cherries, arrive at the mill and sending them back because they were not from the area, they, he didn't know them, and the quality of the cherry that they were delivering wasn't to the standard that they want at Kini. And of course this is incredibly important because with a thousand members this, I should say, has grown significantly over the years, the, the amount of uh, members in Kenya. With a thousand members, you, you kind of got to know that some of them are not going to deliver the highest quality. <laughs> so the middle manager's job in securing this quality is really crucial. Some uh, of these mills work with A and B farmers, so there's good and bad farmers. Kini have done this in the past, but stopped <laughs> because it created too much tension within the, uh, the cooperative <coughs> to have different levels of farmers. And as I'm sure you all know, at the factory here, the wet mill, the coffee is then depolled and uh, fermented, washed, soaked, and dried. But so to explain the process a little bit, I, I uh, made a little presentation here, or a little sort of overview that will hopefully explain it in a different way than me did. But we think if we, if we get it two ways, you might understand it. Uh, the farmer members, so there's a thousand of them, deliver cherries to Kini uh, wet mill. And Kini is also part of a society called Mugaga. And there's four other factories, Kakumwini, Kambara, Gatina, and Nithuku in Mugaga society. So there's five factories in there. 
In Muganga society, the, the role of the society is basically they do the bookkeeping, the accounting for all the factories. Um, they, they have a little more purchasing power when it comes to uh, getting the farm inputs. Um, but what we really want to get down to is to the, the factory level and not just the society uh, level. I, I honestly, I sometimes struggle a little bit with the society thing because Again, our relationship is very much with Kini, and uh, sometimes I'm not sure how much, you know, of the value is transferred between the different factories in the society. Now, from the factory, the coffee goes to the dry mill. It's the dry mill is usually operated um, by the, the marketing agent, uh, and at the dry mill, the coffee is hauled and uh, sorted. Um, in different sizes, the AA, ABs, and so on, um, and also for density, and maybe there's an electronic eye, and so on. But from the dry mill, the coffee is then goes through via the marketing agent to the market. So by law, the co-ops needs to have a marketing agent representing them. I think the reasoning behind this is sort of have someone to negotiate contracts on behalf of the co-ops. Um, you could say maybe protect them so that buyers can't um, cheat the, the cooperatives. Um, but the marketing agent's role is more than that. It's also typically the marketing agent who will provide economical assistance, farm education, and so on. And in my experience, it varies greatly between the different marketing agents in Kenya how much they provide a farm education back to the farmers. Now, the marketing agent has, as me mentioned, two options for uh, putting the coffee to market. One is the auction where the marketing agent will put a minimum price for this particular lot to the auction, and then you'll have different dealers bidding on the coffees above the minimum price and, um, and bidding against each other to, uh, to secure the coffees they need to export to either an import or to a roaster uh, a little more directly. So that's the auction way. But the other way is direct sales or second window, as some of you might know it, which is how we buy our coffee from Guinea. And uh, I think the, the direct sales, um, it allows roasters, of course, to buy uh, directly from either from a society or a, a factory. Um, getting the contract through the marketing agent. Um, and typically, as me says, the, the price will be higher than what we get on the auction. But that's not guaranteed by law. Um, it's more like that's the standard. That's what every marketing agent would want to try and do. But it's not guaranteed by law. And we buy, as I mentioned, our coffee through direct sales. Um, and there's a bunch of our friends, other groceries, who also buy from Kini via direct sales, such as Phil and Sebastian in Canada, I know Hart in Portland, and has been in the UK, has also bought from Kini directly. My hope with this was just to give sort of a different overview of the structure because I think that's quite important and it's one of the things whenever we talk to, uh, to people from outside coffee they try to understand the African market is like this is the model in Kenya but it's not the model in Ethiopia or a number of the other countries. So you have to be very country specific in that way. But I also think it's quite important to understand some of the challenges for the farmers. And this was mentioned earlier, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that the politicians also see is that production of coffee in Kenya has gone down significantly. It used to be in the 1980s that the Kenya exported around 150,000 tons of coffee. And in 2015, that was down to a third. So that gives a little bit of context to why politicians might find it really important to try and do something, you know, even though they not, might not do a great job all the time, you can see why this will be very high on their list of priorities. Farmers also struggle a lot with diseases in Kenya, which is again one of the reasons why we don't find organic coffee there. There's uh, CBD, there's coffee bee frost, there's the different bugs, uh, and testy bugs also, from what I know in Kenya, but uh, berry, uh, bora, all these different diseases um, that I think maybe the next lecture will also touch a little bit upon. And then the next slide will definitely touch upon this access to farm input. So that's fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and so on. Whatever the farmer needs. And that can actually account for a huge, um, one of the biggest expenses for the farmers uh, is this farm input. 
and their access to it and the prices they're able to get is really important for the farmers and it's something they struggle greatly with. And then global heating, and it's global heating still for us in Scandinavia is a little abstract. We know that it's happening, at least we, we know that here, contrary to some other countries. But when I talk to people in Kenya, they see it very clearly on the top of Mount Kenya because when they were kids, it used to be covered in snow caps all the time. And that's not really the case anymore. There's a uh, UN has done some extensive uh, research into Mount Kenya actually in, in recent years. You can find YouTube videos of that. And then the last thing, the most important thing, is payment. That's above all the number one issue for the farmers. The uncertainty of what you're going to get every year, the fluctuation in prices. That means that one year it can be great, next year it can be basically below your cost of production to produce coffee. Like I don't think any of you in this room would ask your kids to go into coffee farming business. Um, and there's a reason for that. And that it's, it's, it, for me it's mind boggling because in Kenya, we all know Kenya as a country that gets good money for their coffee. It gets, compared to a lot of other countries, they get good money. But farmers are still struggling and really not able to make ends meet. And it creates a lot of mistrust, which I think is a big problem as well. Uh, and this is not my opinion, but this is what I heard from farmers, is that they have no trust in the auction system. They, uh, they talk about the cartels, which is basically the fact that some of the companies that are both marketing agents are also dealers. And so one of the, the things that are in newspaper articles is that they have mistrust because the marketing agent will tell the dealer who's supposed to bid what the minimum price is, and they say all the dealers that they are just uh, lined up and will agree not to bid too high. And so when I go to talk to farmers, they all say like, no, no, the auction is bad for us. Even though the auction is sort of a model that other countries are looking to replicate. Um, I don't know if I think it's a, it's a good or a, a bad model, honestly. Um, I think for every farmer that I've met, they stress the importance of the direct sales. But I also see that direct sales can't make up can sell nearly all the coffee uh, from Kiini, for example. So some of their lower grades will end up on the auction. All right, all this means that the farms are getting older and older. The kids, the young ones, they don't want to take over the farms, which I fully uh, understand, actually. Um, <coughs> and they also have much better opportunities, as me mentioned, going to Nairobi to work. And you see this, that real estate is taking over a lot of coffee uh, farmland. Um, so for us, in building this relationship with Kiini, we've been very aware of all of these challenges um, and our own responsibility in trying to improve this and basically securing our future supply chain. And for us, I think it goes very much both ways. Um, I remember the first or the second year I went to Kenya, but the first year I met uh, Kiini, Casper and I brought some bags of coffee to, uh, to give to the farmers. We didn't bring a lot. So the next day, the chairman, Charles, came back to us and said, do you have any more bags? Like, no, sorry, we just brought four. It's like, ah, because that was really good. Because he said he could take them around to farmers, and a lot of the farmers were so excited about it to see that it said Kiini, the name of their factory, on the bags. And he explained to me that for a lot of the farmers, the whole process stops when they deliver cherries to the factory. They don't really know what happens to the coffee afterwards. They don't know that the coffee is exported to us in Denmark and we are putting it in fancy bags and brewing it for guests and all this stuff. And I think it's a complete universal driver. It's something for all of us to feel appreciated and acknowledged in the work that we're doing. It's a motivation. It's something that drives all of us. So that going there for us has been incredibly important, not only to learn about what they do and bring the story to our customers. That's a big value for us but also to provide value the other way and say we have an interest in what you do and it's an opportunity for them to ask questions to us about how we drink coffee and what we how we brew and how we present coffee and this is from a small event we did uh, at Kini where uh, i basically brought like a whole little like uh, coffee shop but a hand brew a station i was brewing coffee exactly the way we were brewing in the coffee shop to share it with them because a lot of these farmers never taste the kind of coffee that we're used to tasting. So their own coffee, they have never tasted it the way that we're tasting it. 
But we have been buying for, uh, from Kini for three years, and we were just about to uh, buy for the fourth time. And then this happened. The Nieri governor intervenes in the coffee sector. How many of you heard about this? A few. I'm sure there's a few of you in the room who got this email from uh, Dormans, who was exporting the coffee for us at the time. And uh, this was about two weeks, ten days before I was scheduled to go to Kiini or go to Kenya to cut the individual lots for Kiini, taste what, which lots we want to buy, and uh, and buy our coffee for the next year, basically. What we did was talking to uh, to Dormans, um, who had been exporting our coffee about what the possibilities were, and they looked really grim, which was very sad for us because we really wanted to buy Kiini again. So we contacted the Danish embassy to try and get a clearer and an impartial view of what was going on. Uh, and I went on the planned trip to Kenya and I met with me, who was then at Dormans, to get their side of the story. And the embassy then had a meeting with the governor to get his side of the story. And overall, this was just an incredibly frustrating and confusing experience for us. Um, being thrown into this politics when you think things are just going well, um, and we sort of had to find out how are we going to maneuver in all of this. What had the biggest impact for me was meeting with Charles from Keeney one-on-one, -on -one, without any marketing agents or politicians or anyone else present, and hearing his side of the version and his honest opinion. And he told me that, to put things into context, the year before, farmers in the area had gotten pretty low prices for their coffee, even though the quality had been quite great. And he said that the governor, he said, the governor is one of us. He's a guy that we elected in this very rural part of Kenya to represent our views, and he's trying to do something. And for us, we, we kind of felt like uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a great move, but when Charles asked us to take a deep of faith and try out this new system, I kind of felt we had to. We had to respect that uh, wish from his part, and we had to respect that we had a relationship with him and not our edge port. So for us, what we did practically was make a list of things that we were worried about. All the items that we said, these are the things that we hear and that we're really in doubt about, so we could check it out. And the first thing was that we heard that the farmers were being forced into this, which was the case for some, but with King, it was not the case. We actually, through the embassy, got the governor to say that it would be okay for us to take a lot from Kini and take to the old mill, in spite of the, the, the law saying we should all take it to another mill. But he said that would be okay because he didn't want to disrupt our relationship. But it was actually Kini who said they didn't want to do that. They wanted to try out this new system, and so we had to go with that. So that's the first thing of the, the checklist. And then we heard these rumors that all the coffee in the area was going to get bulked and sold just as Neary coffees. So I went to the dry mill and found uh, out that lot separation was happening exactly like we were used to. Um, and within 10 minutes, I was actually standing in front of the individual Kini lots um, that you see here. I was also worried if the dry mill could then deliver the kind of quality we're used to, because as you're hopefully aware, the dry mill is also responsible for a large part of the quality that we are expecting. Just a simple thing like getting correct size sorting so that our beans will roast evenly back home in Denmark can actually be a challenge sometimes. But all the equipment was quite new, everything looked very well. I met with the, um, the manager of the mill, who was a curator, and cut with them, and everything seemed fine. So the next thing was securing transparency, because that's really important for us, that to know that the money we are paying are going to the factory. So uh, we checked it out with the KCCE, which was the marketing agent that the governor had appointed. Unfortunately, they were working with the kind of transparent contracts that we wanted. Uh, and as it's owned by farmers, it's a cooperative marketing agent as well, who are not a dealer. All the proceeds, all the money that they make will go back to the farmers. They're not in it to make a profit. And on our end, we followed up with weekly phone calls back to Kini, to the manager, uh, uh, Charles, to check that they also received the money on their bank account. So it's a lot of work, but in the end, everything checked out, and we were able to buy the coffee in the way we wanted. But it was, to be honest, it was a really tough time, especially for me personally. Our relationship with Dormant ended. Uh, I know me wasn't very happy with me at the time, um, but it was, 
I think for me it would have been a much, much sadder situation if we had abandoned our relationship with Kiini when we knew that we could buy the coffee in the way that we wanted to. And I think the shift in the relationship with Kiini the following year was tremendous. You could tell that they trusted us on a whole other level. They would tell us about their challenges, about the politics, both nationally but also locally within Mugaga, and they would be much more open and honest about everything with us. I remember driving in the car with Charles, and we were driving, uh, Kini is actually a small village, so we were driving through the village, and a guy was yelling something at the car, and Charles turned around to me and said, oh yeah, that's, that's one of the guys who didn't vote for me. He really didn't like me. So he was yelling, what the hell are you doing in the car with these white guys? And it's kind of the, the just one example of all these, these things that he would tell me then, because he trusted me, because he knew like we'd stuck out with him through that difficult situation. As a follow-up, the next year, I uh, brought Peter Dupont, who's our uh, CEO in our company, my business partner as well, with me to Kenya, because I'll admit, straight off flat, I'm not very good with numbers, but he is. And we sort of did a, a due diligence, you would call it, with Mugaga. So we sat down with their uh, accounting to check out um, if the money that went to the society actually made it out to farmers. Because if you look at what you're paying as a roaster, and you look at what the farmers are getting at the other end, it could seem like a lot of money is getting lost. And as Kenya is one of the most corrupt nations in the world, we need to make sure that we, we, that we knew that the money we were paying were going to the farmers. So the accounting for Kini is done in Mugaga. Um, it is then audited uh, in uh, Nyeri uh, by the Minister of Ag Agriculture there, and, uh, and the private accountant. And uh, ideally, the members have to approve the audit. I don't really think they approve the audit. I think when you meet farmers, you will understand that the numbers like, make even less sense to them than it does to me, unfortunately. Um, but what we did was sitting down going over all the numbers and making sure that it matched in both ends. And that leads me to the big question, what can we as roasters do in all of this? Well, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell a little bit about our experiences. And I think one of the first things that we can start to do is talk about the prices to the farmers. What are they actually getting? And it's been really interesting for me and also shocking to go around Neary visiting some of these semi-famous factories that a bunch of us in this room have bought from in the past, Karagoto, Kieni, Gichachaini, Tegu, and so on, and then learning that even in, in really good quality years, they were still only able to pay out between 32 and 42 Kenya shilling per kilo cherry to the farmers. And that number probably doesn't mean anything to you, but that's what all the farmers care about. That's what are they being paid out? What are they able to make that year? It, it's roughly, per kilo of cherries, roughly 0 0.40 US dollars. So 40 US cents per kilo of cherry. And then if you do the conversion to what you know as green coffee exported, FOB, is roughly 3.3 US dollars. And of course that price seems very low, but it's also, you have to realize, an average of all the qualities that are being sold, not just the AAs and the ABs, which we might buy, but also the TTs, which, like we were saying, all the really bad qualities that will also be uh, sold for the cooperative. But I can't help thinking, what if we start to think more about how we can secure a higher price paid out <coughs> to the farmers? When I talk to farmers, they say that that insecurity from year to year is what kills it for them. That's the, the biggest demotivating thing in the entire chain. And I kind of been able to gather that I think the breaking point for a lot of them is around 60 to 70 Kenya shillings per kilo of cherries. That means anything less, they're quite unhappy. Anything more, they start to get more happy. And this magic number that all talks about is 100 Kenya shillings per kilo of cherry. That's one US dollar per kilo of cherry. I don't think that's too much to wish for for a farmer. <coughs> What we try to do is work very much with a three-party contract so that we have a contract that indicates the price that we pay to the factory and the price that the marketing agent takes for doing marketing and milling and so on is listed separately on that contract. And we'll look something like this. These are the, the costs that come atop 
of what it's paid to the factory. And in this case, it means that the, uh, the 13.67, and I put it in dollars per kilo, because I think that's what most of you would, would operate with, FOB translating to 11.79 dollars per kilo paid to the factory, to Kiimi. Um, for me, that's, that's the really important price. That's, uh, some call it the farm gate price. I think that's the really interesting price. What can we secure to that level? And if we as roasters start to engage more with that and understand that and try to secure that, I think we can do much, much better for the farmers. And an interesting thing we learned going over the books with uh, Kini was that, there's a lot of numbers here I know, but this is the, the grades uh, being sorted. There's only a few numbers I'm gonna point out. This is the total sales of Kini. This is the sales for what we bought last year. And even though we only bought 11.4% of the total harvest from Kiini, our contribution was almost 21% to the money that Kiini made. So that means that you, as a roaster, if you pay high, you can make a big difference for Kiini. And because us and other roasters have been buying directly from them, getting them a good price for their coffee, the past three years, they've been able to pay out above 80 candy shillings per kilo of cherry, which is some of the highest in the country. And every single farmer I met has stressed that direct sales bring much more value to them. It gives them more money in their hand. But you also have to realize that it's usually the best qualities that goes for the direct sales. But if you think about it, AAs and ABs from Kenya are fantastic coffees. So if you commit to a farm and you buy those qualities, you're suddenly making a really big impact on them. I think for us, and probably for you as well, if we commit to certain, road, to certain factories, in our instance, to Kini, and we stop this shopping around for new coffee every year, we can provide that stability of income for the factory. And that, in turn, for us, improves quality. We've certainly seen this with Kini. Every year, the quality has improved. It's just gotten better and better and better. To the point where the last three years, when we blind cupped it against other top lots, we picked out Kini as our favorite every single year. And this summer, Michaela, who's in the audience, placed second in the World Brewers' Cup with Kini, and it was just our standard production roast just off the shelves, 16 days after roast. And she, uh, she actually uh, had the highest score in the final round in the World Brewers' Cup, just with an uh, average Kenyan, you could say. It scored higher than four geishas in the final rounds. And I think for us in this room, this can be a reminder that some of the best coffees out there are not necessarily these nanolots of 20 kilo geisha, but it can be these cooperative coffees from Ethiopia and Kenya as well. And I think, to me, sometimes they can actually be far superior. So my hope is that one day these coffees will also be rewarded as such. Thank you for listening. <laughs>